Hi, I'm Sarah and I'm a principal engineer at the Financial Times. I've been a Java programmer for 15 years, been doing Go for the last year, probably going to stick with Go, um, but I still have to write Java. And I've <coughs> been leading teams for most of my career and I'm now the platform tech lead for the content program at the Financial Times. And principal engineers at the Financial Times are expected to have things that they focus on. And for me, the last couple of years, it's been DevOps and operability. And we've made quite a big change in the last couple of years. I'm going to tell you about it. So why the title? It's actually a quote from one of my operations colleagues, because he just couldn't understand why anyone who was a developer would do out of hours support unless they were being paid. Because if you're in operations, you get paid. You're on call, you're on shift, and you get paid for it. But when we're thinking about having our developers do more of the support for our uh, applications, we know we have a lot of different groups of developers who work on different things. And the company is really not happy with the idea of paying 12 different groups of people to be on call when they're really expecting there to be quite few calls during that. So you have to find a way to motivate your developers to be on call without being paid. And I'm going to say that that actually is possible. If you work out why they might do that, and one of the things that helps is if you're properly doing DevOps. So this is the boring version of the title. So I'm going to do th three things. I'm going to talk about why DevOps was the right thing for us, what were the conditions that let us adopt it, um, how we approached it, and then I'm going to talk about the hard stuff because it's, that's the interesting bit. Right. So why DevOps? Well, first of all, Financial Times, I'm sure you all know that the Financial Times is a newspaper. Um, but then I looked at our About Us page, one of the world's leading business news and information organisations. Um, it doesn't say anything about newspapers. And the reason it doesn't say anything about that is because most people don't read the Financial Times on paper. They read it on a website, on a mobile app. They read it on Flipboard or via B2B partners that slice our content and provide lawyers with legal stuff that they're interested in. So we have many, many different ways to get content out there. And technology is really important in all of those. Um, so we have to move fast. So traditional media, like everyone knows that it's under threat. Newspapers are finding it hard and new media really understand how to move fast and do things technically. And we have to match them or else we're going to be left behind. So why did we think DevOps would help? Well, the simple answer is because people doing DevOps say it's going to help. And this is the, uh, <laughs> this is the puppet, puppet state of DevOps report, where they, they basically interview loads of people, fill in a questionnaire saying, here's what we do, and here's how it works for us. And Puppet categorise the people who report based on groups of things that come together. So it turns out that if you deploy lots of times a day, you tend to be able to get new features out really quickly. Interestingly, you tend to be able to recover from things quickly, probably because you've had to do some automation to be able to deploy that much. And then finally, the things you do put out tend to be broken less often, which is kind of counter counterintuitive. Because when you start to talk to people about doing multiple deploys a day, they're like, oh, it's always going to be break broken. But actually, it's not. So we wanted to do it, but it's obvious that nothing comes for free. You, could, you can say, oh, we're going to do DevOps. We're going to have a DevOps team, and we're going to spend some money, and we're going to buy some tools. But that isn't actually the way to do it. Because it's, if you want to do it properly, you actually have to change your culture. So cultural change is hard, and you aren't going to take everyone with you. If you want to change the way that you all work, some people are going to really hate it. So you have to find the right time to approach it, and you have to be aware that, that there will be effectively casualties. So what motivated us to change? It helps if you're already really annoyed with the way you do things. So things were slow. Uh, took months to get a production server. I mean, the first project I worked on at the FT, three months, because you would define what you wanted, someone would order it, someone would set it up in a completely non-repeatable way, and then finally you'd be able to deploy your code to it. it. Took days to get a release out. I went looking and I found this diagram that was uh, claimed to be our process for how we did releases. Please don't look at the details. It is literally, do some development, wait until you get a group of stories, because we don't deploy often enough to be able to do each story. We've got to do a group of them. Go through a ridiculously complicated process, do some release testing, because releases almost always break, practice the rollback. 
Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but rollbacks never work. Like, in my experience, they don't. So you test it, it doesn't work. So you go back and you try it again and you try and roll back. Um, and then go to some board where you get a sign-off where you finally agree you're going to send it to production. It took hours to do the releases because we had a monolith, we had my MySQL, we did a schema change. Uh, my favourite release? <laughs> 24 hours. I was only supposed to be verifying it at the end of it, but by the time that happened, it was Sunday. I mean, it started at 6 o'clock on Saturday morning. And the best thing about the release was, four hours in, they decided to start the rollback. So 20 hours were just, we're actually just rolling back. Someone fell asleep at 3 in the morning, and their machine froze, and whatever script was running just died. And you know, It was basically car crash, car crash. I think there were 60 actions as a result of that, in terms of what can we do to try and make this better. So because we couldn't do releases quickly, we had to do them at a time where our journalists weren't trying to publish news, which meant we did test releases at 5.30 on a Thursday morning, which is popular. And the production releases were on a Saturday once a month. So this means that when you're doing the releases, most people aren't around. There's no one there to help you if things go wrong. You've got to have them called in. And uh, yeah, so our processes were manual, which means they're error prone. Um, no two servers were the same. You put something into test, you put it into prod, you discovered you had a different version of Java. Everything went wrong. You actually had no idea what you had on these servers. Release instructions were in a spreadsheet. Yes. <laughs> these are six out of 54 steps in this release spreadsheet. Most of them say, go onto this box, run a manual script, go onto the other three boxes, do the same manual script. Um, I used to review them. I used to be a proofreader. I used to review them. They were never, ever correct. Um, the only reason we weren't absolutely, totally um, unable to do this was because the people doing the releases understood what it really meant. So they'd read it and they'd go, oh yeah, they didn't mean that. They meant this other machine. But that's all tacit knowledge. Um, but, you know, took a long time, manual steps, miss one thing out, it's broken. You start rolling back because you think things are wrong and actually it's a disaster. We had, you know, there were smart people, there are smart people at the FT and they wanted to do the right thing. So we were, we need to control our release deployment process. So we'll buy in some enterprise software and we'll customise it so we have this really good process where we know what's going into production. If you were going to do a release, you had to get a developer not working on that original work to check a box to say, I validated the stuff that's in this release. But clearly there were probably... 20 different things in the release so you didn't do that you just your friend said do you mind checking this for me and you checked it same with QA so you have absolutely no additional guarantees of quality but you have additional steps that just take time so completely pointless similarly we were very careful about change management but it just added extra levels of difficulty in getting something out you could do an emergency release without going through change management so about 90 percent of releases were emergency releases mm -hmm. which is what happens whenever you make things difficult people work around the edges and then you have no idea what's going on so we had these negative things that were pushing us towards changing we also had some positive things. And one thing came right down from the top, which is a change in the way that the business thought about technology. So apparently our CEO and the board around this time were having a lot of conversations about Kodak. And they were specifically talking about how Kodak recognised that the future for cameras were digital cameras, but they couldn't execute. So they were basically saying, oh my God, we might have the right idea, but we're not able to execute on it. So, so they said to technology, you are the people that are going to enable us to do what we need to do. And for the first time, we had people from our technology department at board level. So our CIO was now on the board, our chief data officer was on the board. So that was a change in the message to us was, you know, actually we need you to do things and we're willing to take a little bit of a risk um, if it will make it happen more quicker. And we also had a bit of a change with, notice this is not my slide, this is our CTO slide, um, which is why it's horrible. But basically, he went to a uh, new CTO, new CIO, went to Mobile World Congress, talked about the fact that we were now going to do platforms with APIs and products on top. So that was like the new, in, the new thing was, we're not going to just build APIs out the side of something, which, believe me, we did. Um, we're going to do it properly. So that the platform team worries about all of that stuff, and the product team can just get on with doing whatever it is we need to do this week. We also had three new 
projects kicking off around the same time. So we were replacing uh, the monolithic ancient software that was central to the way we managed subscriptions and our paywall. We were building a new version of our website to be responsive and data-driven from the start. And we were building that on top of a content platform with semantic metadata. And we wanted to do all of these things using microservices. And you can't build microservices. You can't, there's probably 120 services, maybe more. You can't do that unless you can basically create a new server without having to get someone to do it manually and take three months. So we had these requirements and we had things we needed to do. So it's like, okay, we clearly need to change the way we work. And probably continuous delivery was the thing that pulled us in to considering what, what we needed to do. And the final thing was, we actually had a company called Asanka who built our website. Um, and they were a small company. They didn't have separate operations and developers. Um, they didn't have to follow our change process because they weren't actually part of the FT. And they had a reputation for getting things done. And when we pointed out that the reason they got things done was because they didn't have to jump through all the same hoops as everyone else, people started to listen. And, and actually, the interesting thing was, they didn't put broken code into software anywhere near as often as the people that were following the process. And then we bought them, lots of them came in-house, and they were now part of the people making decisions. So it's a good example of, you know, this, they might have something here. It might actually work for us. So that's why we were able to think about doing DevOps. So how did we actually approach it? Well, so we started the way that lots of people start, which is infrastructure as code, automation. And this is the reason lots of people start here is because it's actually not, it's not hard to convince people that rather than having something, someone manually typing something, you ought to create scripts in some way. Um, so we had a, an internal team that, that started to build a platform for us to be able to provision VMs, do deployments, uh, and they were making a lot of decisions, but try to make it, their aim was, developer can put a new application into production in 15 minutes, which compared to three months is you know, amazing. So developers could now provision VMs for the first time. And they could, because they were doing it as a platform, they could build in support for things that they wanted development teams to do. So actually you couldn't avoid it. You were gonna have it whether you liked it or not. So you got monitoring with Nagios. So what normally happened here was you'd put your application into production and you'd immediately get bombarded with alerts because a hit was failing most of the Nagios checks for whatever reason. We also got log aggregation. So you provision with the FT platform, the logs are forwarded to Splunk. Now you have visibility into what you're doing. And this was really, uh, really important early on for us. The second thing after automation and uh, work on infrastructure as code was really about collaboration. Uh, we had two very separate uh, departments, operations and development. I've been at the FT six years. I actually, there are people from operations that I did not meet until I'd been there four years. Which is a bit strange because we're only one floor apart and you'd think you would talk, but no. Um, this is kind of the structure that we had. So we had operations were our first line support. They, they, they literally, they work on shifts. They're sat in front of screens that go red. They're answering the phone. They're going to phone the networks team if something goes wrong. They're going to, generally the reaction to ops for anything is I'll restart the server. They'll restart the server even if the server isn't the problem. The server's reporting an error somewhere else. And this is just how they react to things. Um, but it's great because they're there. Tech ops were who got, the people that it got escalated to. If operations couldn't deal with it, they were a bit more technically aware of the systems. So they could jump onto the boxes and inspect things, look at logs, have some idea of what probably would work. And they, they did all the releases. So they, they sort of understood the systems pretty well. Um, they did, they're the ones that set up all the monitoring until we started this change. So you know, they, were, they were the people who understood operating systems. And then we had development teams. And effectively, you finished to work on your application and you just threw it to operations. And that was it which is why I hadn't met anyone in operations for four years. The first thing we did is we moved TechOps into teams. So we split them up and we put them into individual programs. So now um, you have to get to know each other. And everyone starts to realize that, that you have the same aims. You're trying to build something that, that works. And you, everybody starts to get a little bit more T-shaped because TechOps start doing things that normally developers would do and vice versa. And you start to just trust that maybe people have the right intentions. 
And we started to form groups of people to talk about particular things. So there was a monitoring forum, I know that sounds riveting, um, but it met once a week. And it was generally, I would say it was probably 95% operations, but I used to go to it. And we'd talk about what did we need from monitoring? Why was the current monitoring stuff not working? It, and, and actually, sometimes you were just saying things and it was news to them completely that all the developers hated this and that it wasn't performing well. You know, it'd be like, it takes five minutes to run this query. Oh no, I hadn't noticed because I never run any queries because I just set it up and I never actually use it. And the good thing about this was we just did them for long enough to work out whether what we needed to do and then we stopped. So it wasn't like an ongoing drain on your time. It was just, let's work out what we think about monitoring. Right, I think we're happy with that. Let's move on to the next problem. You build it, you run it. Uh, this is interesting. Um, yeah, I, I think if you aren't doing this to some extent, you're not doing DevOps. But I'm going to go in later into why I think this is not necessarily the case that you are going to be developers or are the first line support. But certainly, if you're not having to support your system, then you're not feeling the pain when you write alerts so badly that there are 10,000 alerts overnight, or your documentation refers to a box that's been decommissioned, you've moved it somewhere else. Um, all the things that you're quite happy to do when you don't have to support it. So it's really important to make developers feel the pain um, of not doing things properly. Um, funnily enough, as soon as we started doing this, developers started doing things to make it better to operate the system. So very quickly, we were building microservices, we put transaction IDs in place across all the boundaries, so you can see exactly what happened with the request everywhere that it went. And developers never miss that out, because they know that, that it'll be incredibly painful for them. Whereas if it was just going to operations, they probably would forget. Um, alerts and monitoring, you know, it's coming into my inbox. In fact, it's going into my product owner's inbox as well, because I basically put everyone on the program onto the alerts list, because I want them all to feel the pain when we're not getting it right. Um, obviously, everyone just filters it, but... <laughs> but, you know, it's quite good to prove that this is, that we need to spend time on stuff. Um, this was new to a lot of people in development, and uh, it's important to realize when you start doing this that you probably have developers who really aren't comfortable with a lot of skills that they need to be a sysadmin. Um, and I think we had a few people on our development teams that were very dismissive of, how can you not know how to do X? And, and you know, actually you can. You could, have, you could have quite happily been using a Windows laptop, doing Java development in an IDE, and funnily enough, you're not able to pipe several units commands into each other and do something really quickly. So you have to give people help with that. So you teach them stuff, or you provide other tools to help them with. And it didn't help on my team that lots of people were on Linux or Macs, but there were people stuck on Windows machines where they weren't going to get an upgrade cycle for a while. And yeah, it's just, you, you have to help each other out. One thing that we did, was come up with an engineering checklist which was aiming to think about all of the all of the things about building an application outside of just what whether you're building the right thing so it starts off with should you even be building this could we buy it what you know is it crucial to us or could we buy something in instead and it goes through you know it, what are the security aspects is it are you using a language that we have enough people to who know how to to write this and then it goes into alerting monitoring etc and this is what it looks like at the moment and there's a lot of supporting documentation behind each of these um, the important thing is you don't have to do it all you just have to consider it so it's perfectly okay to say, I'm building an application that is used by the developers. We fire it up once a week. We don't care whether it's monitored because we'll look at it when we start it up. That's, that's totally acceptable to do that. But it gives you some level of guidance. And we tell our QA team, you know, you're responsible for making sure these have been considered. So we started by handling operations in hours. That's pretty uncontroversial. You don't have to have any debate with people about uh, I don't want to have to answer the phone. I don't want to give you my phone number. I don't want to take my laptop home. You just start by saying, okay, we'll just do it during the day. Quickly, we realized that it can be completely overwhelming uh, dealing with alerts. So within the team, we would put people into ops cop for a week. So it's like you are responsible for responding to people moaning about things that our system isn't doing, alerts, emails. You don't have to fix it, but you have to react to it. Um, so that let everyone else concentrate on work and those people, they're, they're responding to things and they're, doing, they're, they're improving 
things around that area rather than doing chunky bits of work while they're doing that. And you have conversations with your project managers or your product owners about that's using up one fifth of our time, to which the answer is yes. Of course it's using up one fifth of your time. It's doing that whether or not you give it to one person or not. You just aren't realising it when you don't see it. And similarly we have a, um, we have a lane on our Kanban board for things we want to do to make it easier to operate our systems. And um, the reason we do that is so that you don't have that debate again with your product owner about, um, I want this functional thing to be done. We've got an acceptance that there's a certain level of just keeping everything going that it's okay for us to just put things in. And if we suddenly had 18 tasks all in there that we were doing, we'd, people would ask questions. But if we were saying, yes, because actually this is gonna mean we're gonna die horribly, it, it's not gonna, the, the news is not gonna make it out. Yeah, we would bias it towards that. So that, that kind of worked around the process for us. As soon as we started doing uh, the OpsCop stuff, um, someone at operability.io today said, when developers get called up in the middle of the night, they automate stuff, whereas if operations get called up in the middle of the night, they recruit more operations people. And it's true, when developers, once developers are on the hook for it, um, they think, that took me far too long to work out what was going on here. So we started spending more time on the things that provided insight for us into what was going on. And we've gone through several iterations for this as we try and work out, well, what's the important thing for us to know? And this is actually somewhere in the middle because some of these tiles are, here is our production US uh, cluster. Some of them are, here is business functionality. So I can tell you that at the moment, um, I can successfully publish content lists, both in the UK and the US, and people can successfully read them. So we're trying to move towards business related stuff. So actually, I don't care how many services are down if the six key business functionalities are working. The, everything could be down. If somehow everything else was still working, I'd be very happy. And we're trying to do business level um, alerting for other things as well. So this is a Slack channel that our ops cops pay attention to. We just put something in there saying, oh, no one can read content. Um, and people react pretty pretty quickly to that and it's only the important stuff because if you put too many alerts into there people don't pay attention to them so every time you see something in here you have to say did I do it did I take action as a result of it and if I didn't I don't want that to be appearing in in front of me like this and this is literally <laughs> website down level of stuff um, one thing we realized particularly when you're building microservices is even on a relatively small team we've got three teams working together we've got about 50 microservices, you don't all know all of them because you're not all working on all of them. And that means you need to do something to make it easy to work out what this microservice does. So it's quite nice to do documentation as close to the code as possible. So I really like to have a readme that explains what the service does. I really like to have tests that act as documentation. But tests as documentation don't work for people who don't read the language they're written in. That, that's only really going to help the developers. It doesn't necessarily even help some of our testers. Um, and also services, you know, quite a lot of services like, I read something off a queue and then I send it somewhere else. It's not very informative about wider, wider stuff. Um, so we have to think about other documentation. Um, one thing, we one of the programs I've started doing that I want to copy is they've listed all of their services and all the developers have rated themselves from, I've never heard of this service to, I regularly commit code on it. And that way you end up being able to look at that spreadsheet and go, we have some services that no one knows. They don't, they don't know how this works. And so you have to then work on making sure more people understand those services. So I think that's quite a nice way of making sure you have some coverage. Um, we document things at that business level. And this is for anyone that's having to respond to, we can't publish content. Well, OK, you can go and look at this thing that explains what the consequences are, what your alert might be, how you might fix it. Um, the pro problem with things like this is, it's only good if it's constantly up to date, which means you have to make it be part of every bit of work that you do. Um, and again, we've asked our QA team to make sure that part of their <coughs> testing is go and make sure that it hasn't affected our documentation. And in microservice world, you are constantly moving things around and changing stuff, or at least we are. Um, and that does mean that documentation gets affected. So we try and make as much of it automated as possible. Here's a link to a list of all the services that are part of this business flow. And we also do things at an individual service level for first line operations, which is basically, here's who's responsible for this service. Here's some other information about it. 
um, what level of uh, support do we expect? Is it okay if it breaks at 10 o'clock at night? Can I leave it until tomorrow morning? Stuff like that. So that's how we approached doing DevOps, moving to it. Um, but I want to talk about the hard stuff, um, which is you're making massive changes to your culture. And clearly, lots of aspects of that you need to work on. It's not a technical solution. So, you know, operations have spent their career not trusting developers. They're basically like, you want to put your code out, it's going to break everything. And it takes time to change the way they feel about developers. When they started um, doing, letting us provision VMs, I could provision a VM, but I couldn't deploy my application to it because they didn't give me permissions to do that. So I was like, how on earth would you set up a system where I have to go and find someone in, in sysadmin to, to do that first deploy? So they solved, solved it in the first place by giving me sysadmin privileges, which then just meant I had to do it for everyone on my team. And then eventually found a solution, which is to say, well, you know, I guess if someone in the content program provisions a VM, maybe they, anyone in the content program can deploy to it, to which you're basically going, yes, that is the point. Um, but you've got to understand that they're coming from a position of, you always break things. Um, so we needed to prove that we did actually care about these things. And I spent probably the six months with people from platform teams, um, people, people from operations coming along and saying, you haven't done this monitoring yet. You haven't done this, and you haven't done that. And basically going, yes, we are doing it. We are paying attention to this. But it's basically a communication thing. You just have to show that you're doing it. You have to have screens up showing that you're paying attention to it. And just keep saying, yes, we care about that. It really helped having those second line support people on our teams because now they're on our side, they've kind of gone a little bit native. In fact, they get rotated about every six months so they don't go too native. They move on to another team where they can basically tut at whatever that team is doing instead. Um, if you're gonna do dev if you're gonna ask me to be on call overnight, then you can't make me use some absolutely shit database. Basically, you can't make that decision and enforce it because I'm never gonna agree to do it. But that's a really hard thing for people to do, particularly architect groups, I've found. Um, you need to think about who makes your technology decisions. And we used to have an architecture review board and you'd put a document in and you'd say, hi, I would like to do something involving a messaging queue. And they'd say, oh, well, other team used uh, Kafka, so you should use Kafka too. This is a real life example. And you go, but I'm only publishing 600 things a day. I'm not sure I really need Kafka. It might be a bit heavyweight for me. No, we're going to use Kafka. Kafka is our messaging solution. So my program had a messaging queue that we didn't choose, an API gateway that we actively fought against, and an RDF data store that could not stay, would, would not stay up for two days in a row. So eventually, we won the argument. So earlier this year, we moved from that RDF data store to um, a graph database that people actually use and that has documentation and that appears to be fairly stable. But it, until you do that kind of stuff, we basically made a list of we will not be prepared to go live in production and doing support unless we get rid of Kafka. <laughs> well, we haven't though, but um, and the RDF data store and a couple of things like that. Um, but it's a really hard thing for, for people who've been used to making those decisions to let you make your own decisions. And they really worry about, well, we're going to end up with 15 different databases. To which the obvious answer is, is that a problem? If they're all well documented and they actually work, and maybe you, you, maybe you opt for uh, software as a service, so you, someone else can look after your MongoDB for you, but you're getting the benefits of choosing a different technology. Um, it's also about the freedom to not use the stuff that the internal team has bought if it's not any good. So if it is hard for you to do X because they've, do, they've built something that involves jumping through several hoops, it should be perfectly okay to say no. And then one of my colleagues, Matt Chabon, wrote a blog post about this. And he basically said, well, um, the way that you decide uh, as a team should be about how easy it is for you to do something uh, and not about the politics of pleasing someone because you're using the internal stuff. And 
His other point was, actually, if you're an internal team building tools, you should totally be able to win this every time because you actually know us. You can build a solution that is totally purpose-built for how the FT works. And if you can't build something better than people who are outside, then you really ought to have a think about what you're even trying to do. But lots of things happened in the FT early on where people voted by, with their feet and just didn't use stuff that the internal teams had built. And then they had a bit of a think. And I think it's getting to the point now where they, they provide us with much better, much better things. Um, this is apparently a little bit controversial. Uh, the problem for me with FT Platform was they made a lot of decisions. You had to buy into all of them. So you were doing the whole bang. That was it. That was it. You know, you were using FT Platform. You're going to use Puppet. You're going to deploy to private cloud. Um, just a ton of stuff. I, I want to be able to make choices about parts of it. So I'd actually rather that you provide me with um, tools that I can choose to use that make my life better and that I can compose together to do what, what I want. And standards has worked really well for us. So we've, we have a um, standard called the Health Check Standard that says every web application on a particular endpoint, underscore underscore health, should return JSON that says um, I'm healthy or I'm not healthy. And we don't care how you write that. But there are libraries for most of the li languages that we use. So it's really easy. If you want to do it in Java, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but if you want to do it in something else, that's fine. And that kind of thing works quite well, because they also provide tools to use the output of that so that you can compose that to give you an aggregate view of stuff. So you benefit by doing it. This is um, some APIs that our tooling team wrote to manage doing change requests and release logs. So they've got, doc they're, they're well documented. You can obviously just use them um, via Swagger or you curl. Um, they wrote some scripts so that you could easily plug them into Jenkins. Um, this week, at uh, request from me, they've written, um, they've written some code so I can set it up as a webhook in GitHub. So I'm now creating release logs by merging in GitHub. Because I merge and that deploys to my production servers and it also calls an API and, and says, this Sarah did this. And that's really good because they're responding really well to what we're asking for. Yeah, so out of house support has been the most controversial thing at the FT about DevOps. Lots of people, when you say DevOps, just think you're, they only hear out of house support. What they hear is, you're about to, to make my life worse in some way. We ran an internal tech conference earlier this year, and one of our panels was supporting applications 24 7. And it was basically a mixture of, well, I say mixture. I was representing developers and there were four people from operations and it's best described as fiery. Um, the questions were things like, why won't people take responsibility for things that are clearly their responsibility? <laughs> um, so it's been a real issue and you've got to bear in mind that for people this is, there's a lot of people where it's just really, um, they're worried about stuff. So our operations team are really worried about whether the jobs are still going to exist. They've heard about DevOps, they think we're going to totally move all the operations to, to be done by the development teams, they won't have a job. Or maybe they won't get called, so the money they're used to getting because they get called up once a week is not going to be there anymore. Or maybe they're worried that like, the, tool, the teams are all going to pick new uh, software, new hardware, and they won't understand how to support it, and they'll be exposed that they don't know this stuff. Developers worry, similarly, they worry about not being able to do this, but they also worry about being asked to do a second shift. You know, I'm going to do my day's work, and then I'm going to have to basically deal with things going wrong at two in the morning. And people not wanting to do that has got nothing to do with their commitment to you. It's, there's also, it's a big change in your life to do out of hours support. So let's say you have caring responsibilities or you have children or you have a hobby and you actually want to be able to go and do this thing every week and not every third week have to not do it because you're now on support. And I think you have to appreciate that. So everyone feels quite strongly about it. Um, yeah, lots of reasons. So what did we settle on? Yeah, we still have first and second line support. And lots of people would say that means we're not doing DevOps. Um, I think there are reasons, particularly in a reasonably, reasonably sized co company, to have some people who are there to react to things and to triage. Because we have things that break, and we don't actually know what was the cause. So there are no images on the home page. Well, is that because something's gone wrong in the web app? 
or is it because something went wrong in the API, or did something go wrong in the CMS where you're publishing stuff, or you know, there are many, many things that could have caused that. And it's quite handy to have someone there in the first place to look at it and rule out the really obvious things like, oh yeah, we've got a network issue, someone's changed the firewall. That seems to happen an enormous amount of time. Um, so the structure we have now is basically, we still have that first line. Second line is tech ops and they're part of our teams. So they understand it pretty well. And then third line, third line is developers. And we didn't ever really have a third line before. So that, that's kind of new. Um, but you don't have to solve it the same way for every team. So we have some small teams, three or four people. Um, they can't do like some kind of I'm on for a week at a time because they, there's only three of them. So we're still talking about that, but for some teams the decision is, well, we're just going to pick technologies that our first and second line are happy with, document it really well, and just get out of there. Larger teams, my team, we've got enough people, we've decided to split ourselves up into three buckets so that one week in three you're kind of the first group of people that might get called put our numbers in a spreadsheet the idea is that ops will call the first number and keep going until they find someone so we're not we're on rotor but we're not obliged to be at our desks or near a computer we've agreed that we should someone in that bucket should answer the phone within 15 minutes and they should be able to talk someone who's sat in front of a computer through some stuff they could do and ops are really unhappy about this because they're like, I don't want to have to phone around loads of people when there's an issue. To which the obvious answer is there hasn't actually been, in, in the four months we've been trialling this, they've never actually escalated anything. So we haven't tried it. We don't know whether it works. Mostly things go wrong in the day because they mostly go wrong because someone did something stupid. And generally speaking, the developers jump on it way before anyone in ops has a chance to respond anyway. But it's really about trying to, trying to find something that works with the least disruption. And... Uh, we spent far too much time thinking about it rather than just trying something. Um, read a really interesting blog post. Jeff Bezos was talking about um, Bezos was talking about decisions. And he says, "Well, there are two types of decision. There's the irreversible decision. So I imagine like serving Article 50 is pretty irreversible. It's real effort to walk back, but the other decision is walking through a door. You can always go back through the door, pretty much." Um, and he said, people treat every decision like it's the first type when they use these heavyweight decision-making processes, but they really ought to just be aware of the difference. Make the decision quickly, look at it after a bit. And we do this all the time with um, A-B testing. We do it with our processes. We have inspect and adapt as part of our agile processes, but sometimes we just don't do it with other stuff. And I think we could have, we could have started having the discussions about out of our support a year ago and just done something the simplest, least disruptive thing, and then people would have get, got a bit more comfortable with it. Whereas as it is, we're now quite close to a big launch with lots of people still really not happy about exactly what we're doing. So why would someone do out of our support for free? Well, for myself, um, I'll do it if you don't force me to. So I'm quite happy to be on a rotor and I'll do my best, but I'm not going to be sat at home waiting for it. Um, I'll do it because you let me choose the technologies that I want to, to choose. So you, ne you let me choose the right things. I'm quite happy to, to support it or get to, get to the point where other people are happy with it. Um, I'll do it because I have um, pride in what I do. And what we've found is when things go wrong, um, my team, we, we had like something like 15 people dialing in to help out. Because everyone was like, oh my God, what can I do to help? To, to the point where you're just like, it's amazing. People are there till 11 at night all going, okay, let's work out what the problem is. So you do it because you get so many other good things as a result of, of kind of agreeing to it. So what difference has DevOps made? New server in minutes, not months. Um, zero downtime deployments. And the important thing about zero downtime deployments is it means all our deployments are done during business hours. You know, we won't do a deployment on a Friday afternoon after about three o'clock. We tend to do them when people are around. So if something goes wrong, it's all hands getting it, getting it fixed, which is just much less stressful. It's, very, it's minutes from deciding you want to, to put something live to it being live. Um, did 1,400 releases so far this year. It's about 150 a month. It's about 200 times as many as we used to do. So we're getting that 200 times thing that was in the State of DevOps report. It's definitely... Good. And this is our new release process. I mean, it isn't documented. I had to document this for this. We don't really have it spelled out. The, the 
um, kind of pink, orangey ones are the ones that involve some kind of manual step, but they're mostly things like um, tag something in GitHub or merge something in Git. So they're really lightweight. Um, just as a reminder, that's what it used to look like. So that's a, that's a hell of a lot better. Um, Google AMP came along. We did it in weeks. We, did, we only had weeks. Basically, our CEO got talking to somebody from Google who, and agreed that they would do it with almost no lead time. And we were able to do it because we have platforms with APIs and because we're able to spin up new services and have them monitored and supported really, really quickly. So we've, we're showing that we can do things much, much more quickly as a result of all the changes that we've done. So I've talked about why the FT was fertile ground for DevOps, um, how we approached it, and also about the hard stuff. And the hard stuff is all about trust. Um, it's basically about operations not trusting developers and vice versa, and it's about whether your management trusts you to, um, to make decisions, or do they think they know better? Maybe they do know better, but they, they need to be advising. Um, so we're still in the process. The out of hours stuff is, is really still a, probably still gonna be discussed for quite a while, but generally it's been a really good move for us. So thank you. <laughs>